In the name of the one who loves the beloved and love itself. Amen. Please be seated. You may be seeing in the bulletin that Vicar Megan's down to preach, but that was a typo, sorry. I hope you don't mind me doing it. (laughs) She looked at it and was saying, wait, really? (laughs) Um, Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Anybody know where that's from? Leonard Cohen, from his song Anthem. Leonard Cohen is like the the philosopher of depression. Um, And I love it. Ring the bells that still can ring. You've got some bells that don't ring, but ring the ones that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering because there is no such thing. There's a crack. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. I want to talk this morning, this morning about how being broken might not be the end of the world. And I imagine that Simone Biles has been thinking about that over the last couple of weeks. Possibly the greatest ever gymnast in the history of the modern games had some kind of stress reaction and got the twisties. So she lost track of where she was in the air and could have seriously injured herself and was worried about continuing. I wonder if she felt broken. Some people in the commentariat decided to say some unkind and difficult things. I wonder if she felt more broken. But she took herself aside recognized that she was in no shape to compete, allowed her teammates to continue, and took some time to understand what was going on inside. I have no idea what kind of pressure that young woman was under. I've never had to do a triple backflip anything. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, look at me, it would not work. I can't possibly comment on what was going on inside her But at the end of it, she decided to step up for one more performance on her most familiar apparatus, and she downgraded her performance so that she could finish, and she won a bronze. Her instance of brokenness and her way of helping herself to heal opened up for me some space to contemplate how I treat myself. I think she was teaching us a lesson. I'm going to go for my phone now because I can't get these names right without it. <clears throat> Gianmarco Tamberi from Italy is a high jumper who had a major injury before the 2016 Olympic Games. It was an ankle injury that could have ended his career as a high jumper. But he was able to rehab it, recuperate and get back into high jumping. In 2018, Qatar's Mutaz Essa Bashim had the same ankle injury. Should have been career ending. And his friend, Italy's Giammarco Tamberi, encouraged him to rehab his ankle and get back into jumping. This last week, These two broken men who had found healing and supported each other in friendship got back out and jumped against each other. Did you hear what happened? They jumped perfect high jumps the entire time until the very last round when all three jumps were missed by both of them. That means they had an identical record. (laughs) Like normally they'd miss a jump earlier on and it would mean that the judges could work out who got gold, who got silver, but they jumped a perfect round of jumps until the very last round and then they missed all three. So they were in a perfect tie. If you saw on the television, the judge came up to them and said, now here are the rules, you have to go into a jump off. And Bashim said, 
can we have two golds? And the judge started to explain, well, yes, that's in the rules. You can do that if you... And he didn't even finish his sentence. The two friends... who'd helped each other recover from the same injury, they looked at each other. And in a split second, they knew that they both needed to get gold. So they agreed to share the podium. And both got a gold medal. Their brokenness felt like a lesson to me. They got to reimagine the rules of the games and say just beating each other wasn't the most important thing. Their brokenness itself was a lesson in grace. I hope you'll forgive me for also uh, loving the English diver Tom Daly. Um, And he got a gold finally in this Olympic Games, but I don't know if you know his backstory. He's a young man who came out as gay at the age of 21. He loved his father, and his father was his greatest supporter. His father then died just before the 2012 Olympic Games in London of brain cancer. So his father never saw him at the Olympic Games winning his bronze medals back then. That, I believe, was stressful for Tom Daly. He was broken. And he said that in his own personal practice, he's discovered two things that have really helped him. Mindfulness and meditation, and knitting. (laughs) Have you seen it? (laughs) It's all over Instagram. He knits when he's actually in competition to help calm himself down. And he remembers his father And he's sad that his father didn't see him win a gold medal. But again, I think his brokenness teaches me a lesson about how to find wholeness. Elizabeth, thank you for reading that Samuel passage and particularly the last line, (laughs) the way you got it. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, oh, Absalom, my son, would that I had died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Let me give you some backstory. David had been a failed parent to Absalom. He had not raised him well. Absalom had raped his sister. Absalom was extremely vain. Absalom led a breakaway faction in Israel and raised an army against his father. And with some uh, allies, he was on the verge of defeating David and fracturing the nation of Israel. And Joab, David's general, was wanting to go out and win this battle. And the last instructions the king gave him was, Go easy on the boy Absalom. Now Joab ignored him. If you look very carefully at where the lectionary breaks that reading, lots of bits are left out. Let me fill in the gaps. There's a bit in the middle where Joab says, I know the king said not to kill the lad Absalom, my son, his son, but he's leading a rebellion against the nation and it's going to carry on and it's going to continue fracturing us So he instructed his armor bearers to finish Absalom off. Then a young Israelite was going to take the message back to the king. And here's a complicated dynamic. Joab sent a Cushite instead, a foreigner, to take the message to David. David had the messenger killed because he brought that message back. It's where that phrase comes from, don't kill the messenger. Um, The Cushite came back and said, you've won the battle. Israel and the nation are saved. It's over. But all David was thinking about was, what is, how is it with that boy Absalom? The Cushite tells him that his son has died. And then there's that heart-rending cry 
of brokenness in the heart of a father who failed his son, but whose failure created the possibility of a culture fracturing. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Oh, Absalom, my son. Would that I died in your place. It's my fault. Oh, Absalom, my son. He went up to the room above the gate of the city and sat there in grief for a long time. The victorious soldiers coming back came back quietly in ones and twos. They didn't come back in procession because they knew the king was upset. Joab had to go up and speak to David and say, David, this was difficult, was horrible, but it was ultimately the right thing to do. You have to stand up and be the king. One of the things that's interesting about King David is he screwed up multiple times in his life. He was broken (laughs) over his affair with Bathsheba and in this instance as well. But he was able to recognize and in his brokenness repent and then become the leader that he needed to be again. Though I've just told you one of the most complicated stories in the Old Testament. It's all full of brokenness and grief. But in there, I wonder if there are opportunities for the grace of God to be present as well. Some people say that the gospel according to St. John is the least Eucharistic text in the gospels because there is no institution of the Last Supper at the end of the text. Jesus washes feet, but he does not break bread. So some people have said it's the least Eucharistic of the gospel texts. Others have said it's the most Eucharistic of the gospel texts because of the text we just heard read. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. The bread that I give to the world is my flesh. I am here giving myself to the world. We're going to have a reading about the bread of life for about the next four Sundays. So you're going to have time to really think about it. Chapter 6 of John's gospel is possibly the most beautiful piece of Eucharistic theology in the Gospels. He doesn't institute Holy Communion, but he does reflect on the bread of life and what that means. And when he says, the bread that I offer to the world is my body, he is foreshadowing his own brokenness. Dom Gregory Dix, who is a great thinker in Anglican history from the beginning of the 20th century from Nashton Abbey in England wrote the shape of the liturgy and identified what he thought of as the ancient structure of the Eucharist. Bread must be taken. Bread must be blessed. It must be broken so that it can then be offered. Now, other scholars since have said that that may not be the ancient pattern of the Eucharist, but I still like it, and it still feeds me, because I want to also say that it's not just talking about the bread, it's talking about you as the people who are the body of Christ in the world. We take the bread, and we take our lives as gifts from God. We bless the bread. We pray for ourselves and for each other that we might be blessed by God's presence. And then we break the bread. Or we find ourselves to be broken. Because life breaks us. And we think that's the end of the world. But it really isn't. It's an opportunity for God's grace to enter into the world through us if we aren't open to being broken open, God's presence can't speak in that moment. Then we give the bread. Or we offer what we've learned about the nature of grace because of our experience of brokenness to people around us. You know what? A broken person can't be arrogant. 
when they face somebody else's brokenness. A broken person is compassionate, is loving, because they know that they've screwed up. So why shouldn't they make space for other people's mistakes? Why can't they create a space in which those around them can heal because they've experienced grace and healing themselves? So, that's five stories. Sorry, that's a lot of sermon. <laughs> Simone Biles, the high jumpers, Tom Daly, uh, David and Absalom, his son, and the Eucharistic theology of John 6. But I want to end by saying, have you been broken? Did you think it was the end of the world? Have you seen a friend or a loved one broken? Did it look like the end of the world? Or did light break through the cracks? Is it possible for you to let light break through the cracks in your lives? And for you to be an instance of God's grace in the world. Amen.